Hi, we are Team People, and this is the FDR presentation of our robot, the Buster Bot. So this is our team. We are a team of electrical and mechanical engineers from UCLA. Next slide, please. Our problem definition um, revolves around the problem of busing. Busing in restaurants are a, a physical and stressful, meticulous job. It is a low-paying but high-training job. In the low, a long term, consistency is required. In high traffic restaurants, the presence of efficient busters determines the customer flows. So we are trying to automate the whole process of busing. Next slide, please. This is the root cause analysis that we have done for the problem. There are five categories that we looked into. Man, machine, material, method, and measurement. Overall, these problems uh, are under the umbrella of this dish collection problem. Next slide, please. Um, to simplify the problem, we will not concern ourselves with the problem of moving the robot waiter to around the restaurant space. The robot waiter is also only designed to pick up tableware and any leftover food in it. And the clearing of spilled food or drinks of the table and cleaning is not to be accounted for. Additionally, depending on the design candidate chosen, the robot arm will be tasked with picking up either individual plates or a large tray that can carry more than one dish. The problem can be solved with mechanical engineering knowledge of mechanisms and sensors. Next slide, please. So we have looked into several competitors uh, to compare with our robot, the Holobot and the Finibo, and this is the features that our robots will share. The distinction, the main distinguishing feature that our robot has is that we are able to autonomously collect dishes from the table. Next slide, please. So this is our object tree design. So like we list like a couple of like char characteristics that like um that we want our robot to be like um like sound, speed, mass um. The reliability of storing robot robustness and other stuff that we take into consideration. So this is our initial performance specification. So we look at like the storage capacity, the operational speed, the cost, and operation period, and then maintenance of ease. And we want it to be easy to clean. So the next thing is we look at like the morphological chart. So we look at like multiple option for our robot. We look at like the different type of gripper, like the gripper bus, different type of storage shape, storage entry, power, and the base. So this is our variation one. Uh, we have three variations. So version one, two, three, and it's all highlighted in the red. And so to decide which um, variation to choose, we do like a weighted objective method. So we give like, um, for the object tree, we give them number compared to each other, and um, yeah, to see like which one is more important. So, and here, after we do like the weighted objective, this is like the ranking of important, where ten is the most important and one is like the least important for our um, application. All right. So for this robot. This is sort of the full view of how the system will work. We have four main states, idle, in motion, collection, and terminate. Um, the states will be further explained in the latter section. But yeah, next slide, please. Let's talk about the storage system first. Um, we have two input and a two-state system uh, in which the first input uh, indicate whether um, the tray is placed on top of the virtual platform. And the second input indicates if the user have um, cleared the cart. Um, in terms of the state, the first state, S0, is representing the number of trays inside the robot, um, and S1 being whether this robot is operational or not. And this two state will interact with other subsystems uh, within this robot. Next slide, please. All right, so in terms of mathematical formulation, this, this sort of just give an idea of how it works. Um, if the input is zero, A0 and A1 is zero, then this, no matter what the state is, it wouldn't change. It will always stay the same state. Right. The only thing that can cause a state um, change is either when ID input is 1. And in this case, if the A0 is 1, which indicates a trace place, you can see that S0 transition from 0 and 1. Next slide, please. So the following slides will contain the SCAD designs of the whole storage system. Let's first start with the storage card. The card will be uh, 93 by 46 by 125 centimeters in dimension. That's length, width, and height. The materials will be consisted of uh, mainly uh, stainless steel, 304 alloy, that will be for the top, bottom platforms, and the beams that support it. The sheets and the walls and the doors around the card itself will be made of aluminum 6061 to support the robot arm assembly that's going to be attached. And to attach the uh, arm assembly later on, we're going to uh, use M6 screws that's going to be supported using 304 steel flats and triangles, as seen in the picture. 
the total weight of the storage system will come to approximately 90 kilograms and the tray compartments will be made of 304 steel as well. There will be acrylic housing provided for the electrical components to protect it from any water damage. And there will be an aluminum door attached to strap hinges in the front of the cart. Next slide, please. For the storage system itself, uh, the main design is going to be powered by two different actuator uh, systems. The main one is going to be the lifting column that, that we're going to purchase off the shelf. It is approximately going to cost uh, $1,200. We chose to go with a lifting column due to how sim uh, simple it moves and how we're able to connect it with the bottom linear actuator to provide a simplified motion of the storage system. The linear actuator itself will be the MSA SRT actuator. It's going to cost $2,000. We chose to go with a screw-driven linear actuator due to its um, accuracy. It has a max speed of one meters per second and then load capacity of two, 22 kilograms. The lifting column will be the lifting column will be uh, controlled using an encoder, and there will be a T-slot uh, sensor that's going to be attached onto the linear actuator to see where it is. Next slide, please. So these are some extra parts we made uh, for modifications. We're going to add a new top part made of aluminum 6061 and some rubber pads to provide friction. This is going to go on top of the lithium column and it's going to hold the tray itself. And the, the part of the right is the housing unit that's going to go in between the lifting column and the linear actuator. We're going to connect uh, the housing with the lifting, lifting column and the linear actuator, both using MH screws. It is also going to be made of aluminum 6061 alloy. Next slide, please. All right, so for the corded simulation, it's more of a theoretical state simulation showing how the state transition. Um, you can see on the left side, we have the input uh, and the right side, we have the storage, uh, sorry, the states. Um, it's, it's similar to what I explained just now, but I just want to point out, if you see between the 50 and 60 iteration, um, even when a tray is placed on top of the storage system, um, it wouldn't change the state as the storage is full, which indicates that the, the actuator in the storage wouldn't move until um, A1 is equal to one, which indicates that um, the, the restaurant owners have cleared up the storage and is prepared to use again. And you can see that in between that on, on the right graph, um, when when the user press A1, um, the, the second state S1 transition from zero to one, um, that's when it's ready to operate again. Next slide, please. In terms of we bought simulation, we're, we're trying to simulate uh, the storing of just a single tray when prescribed an initial state indicating what is um, first, second, third, or fourth um, location. Um, this, there was some simplica simplification that we made, um, including the bounding object of the plates, bowls, and platform. Um, the middle extender of the vertical actuator was uh, removed because it wasn't um, providing any additional um, benefit to the simulation. And the physics was not applied to the main robot knot since this simulation is not moving. Um, and yeah, next slide, please. So I will explain the ARM system uh, in the next few slides. So before going deep into mathematical formulation, I will first explain how robotic arm motion actually works. The robotic arm that we use for Busserbot has three degrees of freedom. The position of all three links is specified by variables theta one, theta two, and theta three. The set of these variables is referred as three by one vector and the space for all such joint vectors is referred as joint space. The space in which our end goal target resides is referred as task space. In order for a robotic arm to approach the target, we need to map task space with joint space. Inverse kinematics is doing this mapping by calculating joint angles given the end goal coordinates. Once we get joint angles, we need to actuate these joints by actuator. So we use the calculated joint angles as an input. Now using forward kinematics, we, we map joint space to task space so that arm reaches the target and the tip of the third link co corresponds to the end effector uh, coordinates. Next slide, please. So using simple trigonometry to obtain relation between arm links and angles of each joint relevant to joint one, which is our reference frame, we obtain the solution for joint angles. As it, it can be seen in the equation presented on the slide, the quantities that we know to calculate, uh, that we need to know to calculate angles are length of each arm link and n effector coordinates x, y, and angle phi. Next slide, please. So as explained earlier, forward kinematics take joint angles as input and calculate the position of the end effector that the arm has to reach. To represent each frame, we use a four by four homogeneous transformation ma uh, matrix containing orientation and position information, which can be seen in the lower right corner uh, of the slide. And the transformation matrix that transform the base frame to end effector is obtained uh, uh, with various uh, 
transformations, including translation and rotation, and it can be seen in the middle of the slide. Next slide, please. So in order to make robotic arm to move from initial position to the final end, uh, end goal position in a smooth and controlled fashion, we define smooth function of time that will define motion of each joint. To solve the problem of trajectory generation, we will use joint space schemes to achieve the desired position and orientation at the via points. We use joint space scheme because the shape of the path between via points is simpler than in Cartesian space. Furthermore, actuator motion is smoother and easier to validate than in Cartesian space and execution is faster because uh, we, don't, we, we need to solve uh, inverse kinematics at via points only. Initially, we implemented cubic polynomial trajectory, but after realizing that um, acceleration will draw a lot of current at joint initial position, we set the constraints for acceleration initial and final values to be zero as well as position and velocity. To achieve these constraints, we use quintic polynomial function, which mathematical solution is presented in this slide. Next slide, please. So this is like the CAD model of like the robotic arm soft system. So the arm, we have like a 24 inch long and made of aluminum um 1060 alloy uh, the whole system including the motor um, weigh 13 kilograms and each joint we have like an angle could could like um, rotate at a, an angular acceleration of one radian per second uh, the joint one which is like the shoulder joint uh, to the, the first link um, is 109 degrees joint angle two 70 degrees and joint angle three is 89 degrees so um so to break down like um, the component of like the, um, the joint. So this is like, on the left is like the schematic. It's gonna be like a shaft in the middle um, that connected to the motor by a flexible coupling. And there's gonna be two ball bearing that um, allow like the shaft to freely rotate. There's gonna be two retaining ring and a cap to hold like the ball bearing in place. And yeah, uh, for, the, for the shaft to connect it to like the next joint, the shaft we have two holes. One of the holes will be filled with like an aluminum cylinder, which is gonna be hole um, by a washer and a screw. And the other hole will be like a, a one half smooth cylinder and like a thread at the end to screw it in, to lock it in place. So this is the gripper subsystem. Um, the gripper have, have like a link, linkage system. So the motor gonna spin like the screw in the middle, which, which would then move like the, uh, linkage to be able to open and close. The screw has like a mechanical advantage of four. And to, to lift the tray, we're gonna use like a, an electric electromagnet, a uh, four electromagnet uh, on, the, on like the gripper um, claw. So um, this is like the motor selection because like um, we, we choose like a planar um, configuration of the robotic arm. All the weight, all the force downward will be handled by like the material property. So, so the torque from the motor can be transferred, translated directly to like the angular acceler acceleration. So we find like the moment of inertia and we want angular acceleration of one and we can find like the torque we need and like the motor specification. Here we have our engineering drawings for some of the components of the robotic arm. These drawings can be found in our GitHub repository. Next slide, please. Although the suspension system is outside of our scope, we have chosen to include it for the sake of completeness of concept. The suspension was uh, adjusted from that of an ATV and scaled to fit within the average width of a door. The addition of this component increases the total height of our bus robot. Next slide, please. We chose a lead, scred, uh, lead screw actuator to be able to lift and lower the robotic arm. The lead screw linear actuator has a travel span of one meter and there's a lightweight, robust and economic solution for application that comes uh, with an integrated stepper motor with an encoder. Next slide, please. SolidWorks simulations showed that our robotic arm does not yield when subjected to loads of 10 pounds with a maximum deflection of 1.31 millimeters. Our robotic arm has a factor safety of 1.7. It should also be noted that the majority of the stress concentration lies on the wrist linkage mechanism, which is used for grasping and ungrasping the trays. Next slide, please. Here we can see that our robotic arm can handle up to six degrees of deviation, pictured on the left, without having to adjust the robotic arm's position. Next slide, please. 
Here, this view shows that with an angle of 20 degrees, two of the electromagnets no longer make contact with the metallic strips on the side of the tray. Next slide, please. So for the first coded simulation of the ARM subsystem, we tested inverse kinematics to ensure that we get correct joint angles for given end effector position in space. To better visualize inverse kinematics, we used helper functions for 3D plotting from robotics toolbox so we can track the exact position of end effector and visualize the angles that arm takes for each joint. And on this slide, we can observe the simple coordinates uh, given for the uh, end effector and the position of arm that, that's uh, done by calculating the joint angles. Next slide, please. So um, after ensuring that inverse kinematics work, uh, we simulated forward kinematics. Besides obtaining the 3D plots, as in previous slide, we observed the changes in joint. Uh, we observed the changes in joint angles as we limit certain angles. The, fi uh, the figure on the slide shows um, a reaching and effective positions while limiting joint one, which is shoulder angle from zero to 180 degrees. Uh, our arm design has limited joint angles. So simulations like this showed us reachable and effective positions given those limitations. Next slide. So in this figure, we can see the results from simulating trajectory generation using quintic polynomial. Since we had successful simulation results of cubic polynomial, the main purpose of this simulation was to make sure that initial and final acceleration of joints is, is zero as we stated in the constraints in mathematical deriv derivation. We don't want uh, initial uh, acceleration to be zero because it's gonna cause the issue with drawing too much power. Next slide, please. So after completing coded simulations, we created a working flowcharts for robotic arm subsystem to make sure that we can properly code our controller EV bots. Due to our computer limitations, we had to do some recoding for, uh, from MATLAB into Python, but it was worth it since most microcomputers utilize Python. In fact, we selected Raspberry Pi microcomputer for our robotic arm, which preferred pro programming language is Python. Next slide, please. Uh, now we can model our joints uh, and its behavior in the joint space. Um, in this uh, graph, this is generated by our new updated Quintic Polynomial Trajectory Generation Code. Um, for this case, um, we show a simple simulation. Uh, we are using the initial angles of the resting angle, and we model noise of each motor as a Gaussian with zero mean and a standard deviation of the resolution and gear backlash. This plot just visualizes the movement of the joints across time and impact of the noise of, on the position uh, can be seen as a scatter plot. Next slide, please. So the difference between this uh, plot and the CDR's plot is previously uh, using the cubic polynomial, we, we see a parab parabolic uh, behavior. Uh, even though it looks pretty much the same, there's some subtleties. Uh, and then this is be apparent in the next slide, but um, this is the resultant of using the quintic polynomial. Um, even the velocity uh, changes the shape. Next slide, please. And then this is this is come, come back to why we use the quintic polynomial again. We want to ensure that we draw a minimal current at the initial uh, time. So we can see that it, it is true. Acceleration is zero at the points that we specify. And um, this prevents you know, the discontinuity of acceleration uh, causing jerk at certain points. Next slide, please. So this is the Rebot uh, simulation that we have conducted using the models uh, developed by the MAE team. Uh, on the left is the first iteration of our robotic arm. Uh, as we can see, uh, the arm looks a bit long, but now after several design reviews, design changes, we managed to shorten the entire robotic arm, made it lighter. We finalized the use of aluminum of the arm, and then we changed the motors to accommodate the new and uh, reduced weight to ensure that you know everything works in place. Next slide, please. And this is the entire robotic system uh, integrated in uh, SolidWorks. So this is the actual model that will be used, uh, omitting the drivetrain because of difficulties but it will be used in the Webot simulation. Next slide, please. So the bulk of the work of electrical engineers is to integrate the algorithms used in the many subsystems that we have. Previously, we've developed subsystem codes in isolation in week, beginning in week eight, we started to integrate all the subsystems together and develop codes required in making sure that each subsystem interfaces with each other really well. So we ensure that we develop 
interfacing capabilities that will make sure that we don't have access to uh, functions that you know we were not supposed to use. Uh, if, if we're having the base, we shouldn't be able to control the storage. So this is the reasoning behind why we chose to do this approach. Um, and as we can see, ARM is dependent on base and storage. So there has to be that feedback between systems. And the base is dependent on an external terminal and a storage. So we design it in mind that when used in a restaurant, we, we visualize that we're going to be having a human operator that sends a table number to the robot using a computer. And then the robot just moves to that table and it begins the cycle of tray collection, tray storage, and then moves on to the next table. And next slide, please. And this is sort of the summary of how this robot arm works. So we plan on using a simple uh, wireless transmission, possibly using MQTT to send the codes to our base, our, our brains of the operation. And then we designate this brains to be the, uh, the base because it's, it's the one that drives the robot to a table. It's the one that uh, sends the message, okay, we arrive at this table and now let's pick it up. So, and then we pick up the, the tray using our previous developed uh, quintic polynomial trajectory duration codes. We prescribe a velocity and it tries to achieve that velocity using PID controller of our server motor. And then um, based on that, after it stores on its uh, the lifting column, it will use a closed loop feedback control on the storage compartment. So, and this thing um, in future iterations, we plan to make it completely autonomous. So next slide, please. And this is it. This is the overall world that we model our operations in. Next slide, please. And then this is just a short demonstration of uh, the entire workings of the robot. Uh, due to the best interest of time, we choose to implore you to review this on the YouTube channel. Next slide, please. All right, so for the testing of the storage system in isolation, uh, we did four se separate tests. Uh, the first one being the, the tray position variation on the static uh, vertical column. So the reason why I want to test this is that there's error uh, associated with the end effect of the arm. And in the cases where the tray have something where the uh, mass is really high and the center of the mass is at the edge, um, this could cause tipping of the tray, um, even though if the, if, if the um, static vertical column uh, is not moving. Right, so we discovered that the the endpoint the the point here is up to six kilogram, in which where the tray can have something on the edge, and the tray doesn't fall down if it's uh, misplaced um, slightly off. Um, and yeah, if, if we go to like eight kilogram, we can start seeing tipping and, and such. The second test is uh, the tray position going downward. Um, this doesn't have much to do with tipping, but we want to make sure that any um, um, speed going down. When the vertical actuator is going down, it doesn't cause uh, any plates, cups, or bowl to you know fall off or, or um, the, the interaction between them. And uh, just to, to um, mention that for test two and test three, the nominal speed that we're going to use for operation is like around 0 0.2 or less. So we tested up to 0 0.4 to make sure that it doesn't um, cause any problem. Uh, it's the same with test three. Um, and the, the main point in testing for test three is in terms of inertia of the stuff on top of the tray. Uh, we want to make sure that the speed doesn't cause it to sort of um, tumble down um, into the, the component of the storage system. Um, one thing to note also, the, the second and the third test also help us in terms of like the robot navigation itself, because when the robot is stationary within the storage, uh, we also need to know how fast this robot can move um, in real world so that it doesn't, you know, tip um, the stuff on top of it. So, um, that being said, right now, we know for sure that this robot can at least move um, up to 0 0.4 millimeter per second um, without causing any um, trouble in, in the storage compartment. The final test that we did is just to keep track of like, um, what's the average time taken to store a tray. And we compare this by um, taking the, the shortest distance, which is the top floor uh, and the right side, and the longest distance, which is the bottom floor and left side. And on average, it, um, it takes between nine to 16 seconds. And this helps us to identify um, our um, total operation time. Next slide, please. So for the ARM system testing, we performed three crucial tests. Uh, 
which of the first one is trajectory verification on planar motion in joint space with added noise. Uh, the result of this test was that ARM follows trajectory with a root mean square error of 0 0.025 radians, which is uh, really good uh, considering that uh, we added a lot of noise and we were expecting a little bit worse results. Uh, for the second test, uh, we did error in trajectory of the end effector on every time step. The horizontal root mean square, square error was 4.36 millimeters and vertical uh, root mean square error of 4.36 millimeters. This is a very small error. And uh, on the next test, which we did the gripping accuracy of the gripper, we confirmed that uh, even with this small deviation, it's not an issue to pick up the tray because the gripper can pick the tray when the tray is not properly aligned up to 25 degrees of horizontal position uh, when, when the tray is tilted. So uh, the tests uh, gave us a good result in terms of us being confident that our system works. There are obviously more tests that we should perform, but due to the time limitation, uh, we kind of selected the most crucial ones that will give us a better understanding of our uh, system performance. Next slide, please. So this is back to the previous slide, just a, a little visual uh, presentation of the velocities of joints and of joint angular velocities uh, it's real data uh, versus the noisy data versus the actual uh, the actual ideal data uh, we model the noise as gaussian distribution with mean zero and calculated uh, variance from back, uh, backlash of the motor so the the figure on the right is the mean square error for all three joint angular velocities when we vary between lower and upper limit of uh, our joint angles in 1000 trials. Uh, it's nice to observe how the, the actual mean square error va varies as we in increase the number of trials and as we va vary different, uh, different angles. Next slide, please. And to expand more on the testing that we use to model our trajectory, we generated 1000 uh, simulations in Python. Um, because of the limitations in WeBots, we were hoping to actually model this um, noise, but uh, we opted to use uh, this sort of algorithm instead. And uh, we made sure that it follows the prescribed uh, backlash and resolution on each motor. Next slide, please. So on the system integration testing, there, before we even begin testing, we identified a few sources of error. Uh, in between the interactions between uh, subclasses. Um, so we listed three prominent ones, base arm interaction, arm storage interaction, and external factors. Next slide, please. So in the best interest of our scope, we decided to initially not pursue uh, base navigation. But as we were slowly expediting the process, we decided that we might be a good way to illustrate how this uh, storage robot, uh, we, the bus robot works we decided to implement a basic navigation system uh, using a simple two-wheel drive uh, as seen in the joint lab previously. However, this also comes with the cost of uh, some offsets that arise from the interactions of the wheel and uh, the floor rectangle arena. So there's also the error of uh, how our navigation algorithm works. We basically, it's like a gradient descent sort of algorithm. Uh, it just tries to approach a terminating condition. And uh, if it's above a slight threshold, then it's going to decide it's going to stop. Uh, obviously, this translates into uh, minimal errors that you know it's just going to accumulate and result in it not being aligned to pick up the tray. So next slide, please. And now we see the potential errors between ARM and storage. Because if we don't have it lined up properly, then one side of the magnet will be more stronger than the other. And it's going to be causing us a lot more issues um, in terms of like, if it's not aligned properly at the column lifter. So this will be uh, a problem as seen in the next slide. Uh, due to the best interest of time, we don't really have a method to sort of visualize the exact points of tipping. However, uh, we, based on uh, some physics concepts, we decided that this, is, this could be a way to sort of model, you know, what are the regions that the tray is gonna tip. And so as you can see, we model it as a simple probability. Uh, it's an area of the column lifter and it's an expected area of center of mass. Next slide, please. 
So this is the bill of materials for our whole robot. As you can see from the table headings, uh, we have listed down the part name, description, the quantity, and the prices for each of these items. Next slide, please. For our bus bot that we're going to produce, we have uh, laid out some specific requirements, uh, including storage capacity, operation period, cost, and operation speed. Our most updated specifications include having a storage capacity of approximately 0.125 meters cube. It has an unverified operation period. It's going to cost approximately $16,000, and the operation speed is going to be 0.75 plus minus 0.25 minutes. Next slide, please. Our main objective with conducting user studies was to get feedback from our consumers to see which features and aspects of our robot that they're most concerned with. It'll aid us in our future engineering work by showing us which aspects of our robot we should improve and which are good enough as is. We can use the data collected to convince stakeholders too to back up future engineering efforts. Currently, the prototype uses alternating current motors to drive the, mo the motion of the arm. This motor type is not ideal for the finalized bus robot since it must be able to move from table to table inside a restaurant. Since our robot cannot be connected to a wall, we make use of an AC to DC converter. Uh, though this works, it is not ideal as it is bulky, costly, and inefficient. Uh, choosing adequate DC motors with the necessary torque and mass is critical path for our future work. Uh, though the dimensions of the arm and the magnetic gripper do not require changes, the material should be adjusted. Although aluminum is amongst the lightest of materials in relation to other metal alloys, it is still very heavy. This causes the maximum deflection to increase as a result of overloading. Future work should investigate the use of carbon fiber materials, which inherently will change the mechanical design of the arm. Additionally, the wrist linkage mechanism is far too complex and is a point of large stress concentration. Future work should investigate replacing this mechanism with a simple linear actuator. And uh, currently, the gripping mechanism only opens and closes. In the future, we should add a sequence of actions in the code to better grab the tray. Future simulations should also investigate the phenomenon of our buster bot tipping and slipping. And in regards to the finite element analysis, more complex software such as Abacus may be required to run more accurate simulations for car carbon fiber due to its complex nature inherent from having probably a different orientation. So next slide, please. All right, so for the future idea of future engineering work that we want to optimize, uh, we mentioned before that we have a one degree of freedom um, spatial navigation. Um, in real life, we want this to be a three degree of freedom, which include the X, Y coordinate, and also the angle of this robot. Um, we received the, number, uh, the table number from the user interface um, at the reception area, um, able to move from one table to another, um, detect the storage is full and directly head to the cleaning station uh, and dynamic obstacle detection in, in, and um, ensure how to avoid them and then readjust for the trajectory that was supposed to follow. Um, in terms of storage efficiency, we, we wanted to show proof of concept for this project. Um, and that's why we decided on four trays. But as, as we can see from our performance specification comparison, um, that we initially want 0 0.6 uh, meter cubic. It's a little bit low than what we expected. Um, so our, if we have time, that's, that's another thing that we want to focus on uh, in terms of optimizing space. Um, and lastly, in terms of trajectory tracking, um, for the arm specifically, we're using um, the, the, the image schematic to, find, to generate trajectory, um, but the motor um, is, um, we, we input the motor so that it move according to this trajectory. Things can happen um, in real life, especially in busy restaurant where someone might bump on it, um, preventing it from moving as it should. Uh, we want to create uh, and make sure this trajectory is to be more robust so that um, it can um, adjust it, um, follow the trajectory if, with um, external um, disturbance. Next slide, please. Um, some things that we didn't add um, into our feature that, that we're considering um, are well, it's required, uh, but we didn't include in our current analysis um, just because uh, there's already a solution um, out there, um, that being the camera detection um, to detect the actual position of the tree. Right now, we just model it um, by um, knowing, assuming that we know the position um, with some error, 5% error due to the camera errors. Um, we want to implement the actual camera system, figure out the optimal placement um, of the camera and this robot so that it can use for threat detection and navigation. Um, and yeah, finally model uh, and see the obstacles uh, around this robot. The other one that we sort of discussed very early on, but we didn't really revisit that much was uh, backward usability in which um, this robot is capable of picking up trays from a table, uh, put it in the storage um, and 
deliver it to the kitchen slash cleaning station. Um, this same usability can work in backward to transfer food from the kitchen um, into the table. But of course, there's um, a couple of like things that we need to consider in terms of like um, hygiene issues in making sure that the storage compartment is clean. Um, we need um, no contamination from storing the use tray and such. So it's, it's something more of a, a concept idea that, that is also can make this robot um, more usable for the price point that we're giving. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, that's that's our presentation on Buzzerbot. Um, we are team people and we work on it for six months. We consist of uh, electrical and mechanical engineer. Um, and thank you.